Hi, Gail Fugit, President and CEO of the Advertising Research Foundation, and we're here. Gosh, we're like we're we're in the second half of CES oh, by, yeah. by my calculations, right? We're at halftime yeah. uh, of CES, and it's already been a bit of a marathon. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people here this morning. I think people stayed out and night. had a few parties. Yeah. Um, and I'm here with Shannon Reed, who's the uh, president of digital for MEC. And you've had such an interesting career, but you yeah. were just uh, sharing with me that you were a dancer. <laughs> Into so theater yeah, for so years. I think since we have to like really bob and weave and dance now. In the advertising uh, <laughs> industry, um, how, like, tell, talk a little bit about that, about your background. <laughs> My background, I spent. Uh, so I started. And how did you get to CES 2016 from being a dancer? That's yeah, what that's I want to tell well, your story. And you have to be careful when you say dancer in Las Vegas because it means it's yeah, a I know different exactly. thing than what I did. <laughs> I did meet one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they're amazing, but that's not the career I had. Yes. So I started very young um, at uh, Houston Grand Opera. And a wow. small theater school that I was going to was the was supplied the children's chorus for the opera. Um, so at eight or nine years old, I was doing performances with Houston Grand Opera, and the next thing you knew, I was doing any type of regional theater as a as a child. So I grew up doing musical theater. I went to a high school for performing and visual arts. I was a dance major. Um, I majored in speech and communications when I finally went to college. Uh, and then I had this moment when I moved to New York in my early twenties where I realized. I was good enough to not have to wait tables, not that there's anything wrong with waiting tables, but I was good enough to actually have a career and not have to have another job outside of having a career as, an, as a performer, um, but I wasn't going to be Cheetah Rivera, right, I just, and yeah. I love Cheetah Rivera, uh, but I, didn't want to, I, I wasn't going to be above the marquee. And so it was a bit of an a aha moment to have it in your very early 20s. I was maybe 21 when I had that realization and decided... Well, how did you deal with that? Because that's, you know, one of the things that I, that I want to, you know, kind of evangelize a little bit is mm -hmm. how do you deal with failure or, yeah, you know, with that... Yeah, realizing that, that your like, life is going to take a completely reset. different turn. And yes. Yeah, that reset moment. Well, so I think that's a big piece of it right there is that moment where you go, you know what, it's not the end of the world. So something's going to change, and now I just have to figure out what that change is. Because it's really easy to focus on the, oh, God, I feel like a failure at this. Yeah. I never felt like a failure at performing, and I still love to perform. As some of our employees could attest to it. <laughs> put together a little glee club that sang at our holiday party, and we had a great time doing that as well. So I still love a stage, and I still love a microphone, and those skills still come in very handy for me in a lot of the work that I do every day. But the the moment of, of realizing that being a performer wasn't going to be my career path just meant that I had to figure out how to channel that creative energy in new and different ways. I ended up working for a research group that's now part of Nielsen, a company called Spectra. Yeah, I know and Spectra really well. Yeah. Because and I, I was at General Mills. Oh, we right. Were of clients. course. Of we were course. big clients. You were very big clients yeah. of Spectra. I was working on, on Heineken and Pfizer and a couple mm -hmm. of other brands, which was a lot of fun. I, I mean, that was almost early day targeting, programmatic, like everything absolutely. people are talking about now. No, it was it was complete the audience profiling. Edge. Yeah, it was yeah. the leading edge of that. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to be able to go in and see what people were putting in their in their shopping baskets on top of the product that they already had, to understand the mindset of the consumer, to understand how their demographic changed what they purchased, to understand what their geography changed about how they purchased. I always thought trading areas were an amazing thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. Like we, we talk about a circle around a story. It took a while in digital for us to understand that when we were doing local targeting, and I remember the first time Google came in and sat down with me and said, "Well, we can we can now geotarget." No, this was at, your agency. at my at the agency that yes. I ran before before MEC. Um, this is so this is early days of Google. Yes. The first time they launched geotargeting in search, <laughs> and they came in and they said, "We've got geotargeting, but it's a circle, so it's a you know a mile around the store or two miles mm -hmm. around the store." And I said, "That's all well and good, but if there's a bridge or a river or something that cuts off the trading area, action needs to be hand drawn." And eventually, they came out with a, an opportunity for us to hand draw the trading areas of the store, which was fascinating. But it took digital a little while to catch up to those things that we were already doing in the offline world. Yeah, I mean, look, that I, I remember that from behavior scan testing because yeah. it would actually um, create you know a test and control and they were able to control that because mm -hmm. of these because of the river yeah. between the cities or Makes some geographic barrier that right. they probably aren't going to cross over to go shopping on the other on the other side yeah um, fascinating stuff yes it is fascinating so it's interesting you're I'm, and I'm not surprised um, that you say that you that you like to perform because you've become a, a you're really a provocateur in the industry oh. you've made some you are you've made some really bold Old statements, you know, around digital and Hopefully advertising. Not get me fired Excellent. Soon. No, they're, <laughs> no, they're. I mean, look. I think it helps to to stake out a point of view and sure. start a conversation. Yeah. 
I and agree. That's how uh, some of your quotes. One that's been picked up in a few different places is um, that advertising today is like a three-year-old with their parents. <laughs> consumers and yes. advertising, right? Yes. Yeah. So say a little bit more about that and how you see that. I thought it was a pretty good example. Thank Having you. had a three-year-old a number of years ago. <laughs> yeah, well, mine's now eight, um, my youngest. But yeah, it was, it's, so it's it's interesting. I think we, we started this, uh, di the digital side of the business, we started with this idea that we were going to be able to, t to target and track everybody, which was great. And I will say that I think our biggest fault in the industry is that we tracked everything. Mm -hmm. Digital tracking and the promise that we gave to our clients of we can track it all, even though not everything is worth tracking. Well, and the question is how. Well, right. Because everyone it, was using is different metrics it? and is they Is it the right metric? Do they fit together? Are you looking at the same picture? And then we created this kind of false uh, sense of, well, I can track it all online, but I can't track it offline. So am I getting the same value from it? And so it created this kind of false economy. That's a whole other conversation. So the, the three-year-old thing kind of came into play when we were talking about the annoyance factor of advertising. Why are consumers ignoring us? They're, they're skipping through our commercials. They have banner blindness. They have uh, all of these challenges with actually reading the magazines and newspapers that we put in front of them. They're, they're ignoring us. And why is that? It's because we're annoying. And in many ways, especially in the digital space. Annoying by media placement or by both. the creative? Both. Because you've also made some comments about the creative um, kind of getting the change. junk off the air, which yeah. I, you know, that's paraphrased. But. No, but it's true. It's true. I think there, there's this challenge in the, in the digital space that we're moving so quickly that we keep producing creative that either, and we started this way. We started with we're going to take the print ad and we're going to shrink it into a banner ad. And that didn't work mm -hmm. and we know that didn't work but you'd be amazed how many people still do that mm -hmm. how many advertisers still do that then we had pop-ups which everybody was annoyed by the pop-ups we still kind of have pop-ups if we notice our mobile ad units some of them are not that different we call them home page takeovers or we call them like interstitial units it's essentially still a pop-up you still have to find that little x and click out of it it's annoying as all get out um, the message that we're ultimately delivering to that consumer is not interesting that's our problem. Our problem is that we're so going up to the saying, pay attention to me, and we're not showing them anything that's of value. Right. So who's doing it well today? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I hate to say this. I don't know that anybody's doing it exceptionally well, to be honest. And I think there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, partially, it's the cost of getting creative done. We have the ability to target the right person in the right place. We know how to get to you. We so may it's not, not the tools. It's not the tools. It's the volume of creative executions we can get to. And there are some really great companies that are coming up that are doing great work and giving us automated creative. And some have existed for many, many years. Retailers have done a fairly good job of this by showing you that sweater that you left in your shopping cart huh. that they then want to remind Which you to buy. Which can also be very annoying. Can be very annoying, especially if they don't suppress it correctly and they end up showing you the sweater you already bought. Mm -hmm. I have this example that I always use of, um, I hate to pick on the folks at Lamps Plus, but it's true, so I have to I have to admit it, right? I bought a, a series of light bulbs from Lamps Plus for a specific lamp, their specialty light bulbs. I was very excited. I then got followed around for the next month by those light bulbs. Hey guys, I already purchased it. Yeah. They're, de they're done. Yeah. I'm, I'm completed. Now you can show me something else. Yeah. Or come back in or just two years after Or just suppress me for, for <laughs> six down. months and then show me something mm -hmm. else, right? Um, and then remember that I bought this. So I think the technology is evolving rather quickly. Um, I think we're going to see more opportunities, but getting the cost of the creative execution down in a way that the creative is still correct for the brand. And I think that's where the conflict comes in between the creative agency and the media agency. I have all of this ability to go buy all of this space and put all of these automated creatives in place. But the creative agency is saying, hold on a second, we've got a brand aesthetic that we need to hold on to. We have a, a vision for what this creative needs to look like. We can't just automate this. This is mm -hmm. not a, something that, if it looks terrible, then it's actually doing a disservice to the brand in that moment, right? Um, so there has to be the, the cleanliness of, of getting the creative agencies to say, okay, we embrace this new technology and we're going to start developing for it and getting the media agencies to say, okay, and this is the volume and, and execution that I need and finding how we make creative units that are actually beautiful that can also still provide mm -hmm. value to the so customer. So is the cost in how much time it takes now that there are so many more touch points? Um, is it, do you feel, yeah. and it's and kind of a, uh, an ancillary question, mm. do you feel that it's going to take different kinds of skills among the creative 
you know, for creative inspiration yeah. to, to create great creative across all these different touch points instead of doing, as you said, taking right. a print ad, making it a postage stamp, you know, running it across all that. We've all seen that. It so doesn't I, work. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I think we still need that creative visionary, right? We need somebody who sets the tone for the brand. We need somebody who sets the, the vision for the brand, who sets the aesthetic for the brand. Um, once that's all in place, I think the opportunity there is to have a new set, I think you're right, I think it is a new set of talent that comes in underneath that that says, all right, with all of the different tech, with all of the different tools, with all of the different capabilities, how do we translate this vision that is the existence of the brand into all of these places to make it feel consistent? Is that you or are you at the vortex of... I, so that's a really interesting question. I don't know. I think it has the opportunity See, I think roles to. Roles are shifting. Well, I think we are. I think you're right. I think there's an opportunity for it to be a little bit of the media agency to say we're going to help you translate this. Mm -hmm. I think the creative agencies have the opportunity to say we're going to have the people in house to translate this. And I think the the progressive media agencies, or the sorry, the progressive creative agencies are the ones that are hiring that type of talent. And the progressive media agencies are the ones who are looking to how do we get into helping the creative agencies. And so there is this kind of middle ground where we're we're both playing, and it will sort itself out over time yeah, as to where I it think, lives. Like, I, I often speak to my team about the idea of being 51-51 instead mm. of, you know, 51-49. So yeah. each person, like, actually That's overlaps good. a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, because I, I really applaud you for the high bar that you're holding for okay. creative quality. Yeah. And so it really seems like if you could also discern some of that mm -hmm. and offer that more guidance um, right. instead of taking it and just placing it and then kind of see well, what happens. I think the challenge for the creative agencies often is they don't they don't get exposure and it's not their fault, right? We have the media companies coming into us every single day, multiple mm -hmm. times a day saying, hey, we came up with this new creative mm -hmm. unit. We've got this new opportunity. We've got this new placement that we can put you in. We see those all day long. They don't go to the creative agencies to say, hey, we've got this new creative unit because the creative agencies aren't the ones spending the money with them, right? Mm -hmm. So we see it all day long. I think the partnership needs to get stronger. But to, and that's one of the big changes I think I'm seeing over the course uh, of our clients, at least, is this desire to make sure that we really have this true, not just power of partnership within the organization that is their media agency, but a partnership that also includes their creative agency, mm -hmm. that we are all at the same table together from the moment of the creative brief, which is always the first thing that happens, through to the execution of the media plan. If we can all sit at the same table and be a partnership, it does make the whole process much more fluid and I think also opens us up to bigger opportunities. Yeah, I love that. So you created your own agency, which is, okay. I mean, breathtakingly impressive. Thank you. And I'm really interested in um, the fact that a number of your clients were actually luxury brands. They were. Um, so I'm, what I'm intrigued by is how do you market luxury brands? I mean, we see it happen all around us, but, sure. you know, peel back the curtain mm -hmm. and, you know, just share a little bit about that because sure. what you, you just spoke about in terms of the creative and the media planning is a really good backdrop for, um, all right, now you have something and you're really trying to get people to separate a lot of money from their wallet, right? <laughs> it's absolutely um, true. It's absolutely true. How, how did you approach that? So luxury is an interesting space. It's a space where you have to truly... You have to value the brand first and foremost above everything else. If you can understand what the, sh the brand you're working on stands for, who they are How in the marketplace. How do you do that? A little bit is about living it and breathing it. And that's mm -hmm. not to say that if you're working on Vuitton, you need to go dress yourself in Vuitton <laughs> right. head to toe, although it's a lovely thing to do. Uh, and I do carry a Vuitton handbag. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are there are certain perks to working in this <laughs> as luxury privileges. business. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but it is to say that if you can spend some time getting into the mindset of that customer, and some of that is research, some of that is spending time in the store, some of that is listening to the brand. And the brands were always really wonderful with their agencies or at least the brands that we worked with, about bringing us in. They would tell us the story behind the craftsmanship. We worked with the Moet Hennessy group for many years. And to do an entire flight of Hennessy from uh, from the very bottom of the line to, to Richard, mm -hmm. um, and to be able to understand the differences between those different layers of cognacs and what they brought to the table mm -hmm. and why a customer would be willing to pay so much for a bottle of Richard versus a, a bottle of XO. There's a very big difference in that market and understanding who that customer is in each of those moments and who they're building it for, mm -hmm. I think helps you appreciate why you're doing what you're doing. Um, is they, it ever consumer to consumer? Is it as a badge? Something that... So that depends on, on the market that you're in across the globe, mm -hmm. right? 
In the U.S., there is a little bit of badging, but not as much as you would think. And especially after the 2008 recession, we saw right. a lot of folks really pull back on the badging. That was true in food, too. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And there were there were rumors that I can neither confirm nor deny of people who were shopping on Madison Avenue and Fifth Avenue who were walking out with brown bags as opposed to the bag that mm. said the name of the brand on it, right? Mm. Um, and I think some of that That's happened. That's really interesting. I've never heard that. Yeah, I think some of it happened. I think some of it was a little overplayed. but yeah. Fine. A little urban legend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is okay. Um, but it, we did see consumers change the behavior of what they were buying because they didn't want it to be so in the face. But they still bought luxury. Luxury didn't see that decline that the rest of the industry did. I, that's what I think is fascinating. I think that's yeah. true now, today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I think it's it's interesting to watch that consumer change. Now, in China, it's a completely different story. In China, it is about the badge. It is very much still about making sure that people know that you are carrying a Louis Vuitton bag or you were carrying a Prada bag, and so that badge is still very, very important there. Um, we are starting to see that change in the most upper echelons of Chinese mm. consumer, mm. Um, and I think you'll continue to see that trickle. But it changes the product set that the brands put forward. I don't know if you noticed, but luxury brands, for the most part, over the course of the past few years, have actually raised their prices. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have shut down their more entry-level product mm -hmm. lines. Um, to focus on their higher Maybe be more exclusive. Yeah. Do you think they're better at um, being really specific about brand guidelines? Absolutely. How Absolutely. do they do that? And how do they like how do they govern that within their organization? I think I'm, a lot of people could take uh, a page out of that book. They and they it. govern it by the people they choose, so they understand that. It, so it's interesting. So it's not I, a notebook that gets passed around. And well, and it is it is a bit right. There is you know we will do this, we won't do that, and that those pieces get passed around the same way a brand book gets passed around. Mm -hmm. These are our colors and these are our fonts, and nothing should ever be smaller or bigger than X, Y, or Z. Those things are fairly standardized. The interesting thing is when they choose the partners that they work with, whether it's their PR firm or their social media media firm and their agency, I often get asked, um, how is it that we had an agency that was a fairly small to medium-sized agency that had so many luxury brands who were technically competitive with each other under the same roof? I worked with the Richemont Group. I worked with the Armani Group. I worked with the LVMH Group. Those are not companies that normally feel comfortable being within the same organization. The difference is that there is a luxury expertise that we brought to the table and they appreciate and value that expertise above and beyond the concerns that they would have about the competitiveness. The brands themselves, for the most part, understand where they each fit and how their customers are different. And there are competitors and Dior and Chanel. But you will understand continue the to fight consumer and you bring that consumer. Exactly. Lens and we bring that consumer to focal point to them. So to say this is your customer online. She behaves a little differently. She so goes to sites that, that you're surprised about. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the, the placements that we chose, these were not brands that were going to be running in just standard programmatic banner advertising where they could show up anywhere. We very carefully chose the sites we were running on. We very carefully chose the placements on those sites. The suppression of competitors, the suppression of anybody else on the page. If you notice digital luxury brands when they advertise, quite often, not true for the retailers, but quite often for the brands themselves, what you'll see is that they take over the entire page. There's no other ad unit on the page from any other advertiser. They don't want that competitive nature, and they, they're all okay I mean, with it. I see that in print. I still like right. print myself. I love print. You know, in terms of like yeah, your fashion and your, you have a, you know, I still get my women's wear daily. I, yeah. Yes, I love it. Yes, you're important <laughs> there too. Um, so, 2015, we're kind of looking back and, and um, asking, you know, what success, what was your biggest success in 2015? And it certainly is a dynamic time. It is um, a and you're very time. articulate about what the opportunities are. Yeah. But as you look back to last year, um, then maybe it's a building a foundation toward 2016. But mm. what do you feel your biggest success was? And yeah. and I think you um, had, um, you know, a kind of a mantra. You know, mm. you're looking at um, being, I loved this, you know, don't just live, thrive. Yes, that's and, our MEC mantra. And then you said you were going to simplify. Yes. And simplify in your home life and... <laughs> work and yes. so may, maybe weave that in a little bit. Sure, sure. So I think because that's a that's a bold statement actually. That's a little more bold than we're going digital or we're right <laughs> we're already digital. It's funny yeah. we I mean I'm I'm part of an eight hundred and fifty person company in North America. Three hundred of them are digital people. And I would argue that even probably closer to four hundred are yeah. really digital but aren't titled digital. Mm -hmm. um, so we are digital. Impressive. I'm not concerned about that. Um, what I am concerned about is making sure that our clients feel it and that uh, that we behave that way in everything that we do because we do really believe in putting uh, data at the heart of everything that we do. 
Um, I, so 2015 successes, 2015 was an interesting year. So I started at MEC in May of 2014. So 2015 was my first full year at MEC. Um, yeah, that's a big one. It was a big one. And it was an exciting year. We won some amazing pieces of business, including L'Oreal and GoDaddy. Uh, at the end of 2014, we won the Tiffany business, uh, which made me feel, thank you, which made me feel a little at home, right? Coming back to some of my luxury roots Absolutely. was a lot of a lot of fun. I'm sure um, that had something to do with it. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I think, uh, I think MEC has a tremendous story to tell in that space. And um, I think we differentiate ourselves by being a very creative media agency. Mm. See, um, it is about the ideas at the heart of what we do and driving that customer experience. And I think that's one of the things that drew me to MEC. Uh, we had a year where we won the iMedia Agency of the Year. We won, I won iMedia Marketer of the Year. Um, to me, that was such a badge of honor as a media agency to have that digital kind of checkbox of like, you guys did it. You're not just a media agency, you are a digital mm -hmm. media agency. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really big statement for an agency mm -hmm. of our size and, and an caliber. external endorsement, both of that and of your leadership. Yeah. I'm really glad to hear you say that from, especially the standpoint of um, what I see in the next generation is they don't always recognize, no, this isn't going to keep happening all the time. You don't get right. these awards all the time. You need to <laughs> right. step back and really say, wow, job well done. Take a moment. Take exactly. a moment. And I took a moment with the team. We opened somebody, when I first joined <laughs> MEC, this is just a little aside, when I first joined MEC, um, it was lovely. Some of my friends in the industry sent me bottles of champagne and wine and yeah. flowers and all of that. It was really, it was wonderful. Um, and some of them I saved. And one of them was a bottle of Cristal that I just kind of tucked away. And I said, you know, for the right moment, oh, I love that. I'm going to pull it out. Yeah. And so um, when we won the iMedia Agency of the Year, uh, I, I knew in advance that I had won the marketer of the year because they asked me to produce a video because I wasn't going to be there to accept it. Mm. But I had to keep it kind of hush-hush. Mm. But then I didn't know who'd won agency of the year, and I assumed since they didn't tell me, because I had I was well, told about the great. other one, that we didn't win it. So now I'm sitting there with curiosity, and I'm home, and I'm sitting there on Twitter watching things come through while my daughter is asleep. And she asked me to put her to sleep that night, so I'm sitting there quietly in her bedroom refreshing Twitter. Um, and I see the announcement the house up that we won. I, almost. I <laughs> kept it in, but I went, oh, my, my response, and it's still on Twitter, I'm sure, to iMedia was, am I reading this right? Did we just win Agency of the Year? So excited, so excited for the team. It really shows the great work that the team is doing. And one of the things that I think is, is interesting about our teams is we're very integrated. Um, you walk into a, a media agency typically, and even within a digital media agency, mm -hmm. and you have the search team over here, and you have the social team over there, and you have the whatever, all the different departments are mm -hmm. kind of off running their own thing, and then they come together on behalf of the client. And that's not the belief that we have. The belief we have is very, very different. The client sits at the heart of everything that we mm -hmm. do. Those team members really actually that sit that's your orientation. physically together, right? Mm -hmm. And we have, to be clear, a couple of places where that's not currently happening that we're fixing over the course of the next few months. We're physically putting all of Campbell's physically together, all of Marriott physically together, because that's the business that they work on every day, mm -hmm. and that should be their home room. That should be the place they go to every day. Digital, search, social, analytics, whatever it is that they do, that's their classroom. That's where we keep them up to date on what their expertise is, that we make sure that they have the right skills to take back to their home room, to take back to that core foundation that they work on every day and help their clients. So it's our job to continue to educate and grow that talent, make sure that they feel like a community outside of their outside of their day-to-day -day running of a client business, but they also feel like they're part of that running yeah, of a I mean, client business. It also really feels like you've made it very grassroots. It's yeah. not like bring in the tech guy no. right, for the consult. It's right. like by right. having your you know three to 400... Um, they're built in. Right, people they're built out of in. eight. That's right. really... Um, a commitment yeah. uh, and, an, and a strong, you know, it's like a philosophy. It is. That this is how we're going to grow. Yeah. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, so how about a prediction for 2016? Ooh, uh, this is one of my favorites. So I think 2015 was a year where we really spent a lot of time talking about viewability. Viewability was the hot topic. Right. MEC and Group M took a very strong stance on viewability. I took a very That's strong true. stance along the side. It's mm -hmm. funny, when, you, when we started our conversation, you said I've made some bold statements in the marketplace, and I, I thought to myself, you know, I think that's part of the reason I fit in well with Group M. Yeah, <laughs> yes. We uh, take a stand. We take a stand yes. on things and it's and the do what we think that. is right for the industry and mm -hmm. right for our clients. Um, and we we took a stand on viewability that I'm very proud of, and we've made some great strides mm -hmm. on it. Uh, the technology is there. The fun part about the technology that I think is the future is not just measuring on whether the ad was viewable, but how long it was in view. And that technology is there too. So I think in 2016 we're going to see a lot of test and learn 
on time spent in view. I and agree. Potentially moving to what I like to call the CP30, a cost yes. per 30 seconds of view time. Um, and I would love well, to see that as a metric that we all can buy on. That you actually set the hook with the consumer. Right? Well, and so the, the it's funny, the piece that you were talking about where I talked about the three-year-old kind of tugging in your sleep, yes. mommy, 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 yes. right? Um, in that same argument, I was talking about the uh, the the time spent in view, it takes close to seven seconds for a consumer to realize that they've actually seen something, mm -hmm. right? So if we're moving on a mobile screen at 200 pixels per second, did that, the ad may have gotten 100% pixel in view, but was it really in view? Did it really create an impression? Mm -hmm. Probably not. So I think our definition of impression needs to change, and that's where I think the opportunity to talk about cost to, cost in view or 30 seconds of view time is actually an opportunity to truly make sure that we're making an impression. Do so you believe in experimentation? Oh, very much. Yeah. No, if you're not experimenting, then you're not you're not pushing the industry forward, and you're not looking for what's new and interesting. That's the fun part of what we do is that yeah. it's constantly changing. Love that. So you heard it here first, right? Shen and Reed, first thing. We're like <laughs> here by ourselves. First thing in the morning. Crickets. <laughs> thank you so much for My joining pleasure. us. You're really, really inspirational. Oh, thank you. Um, dancing your way through the industry. <laughs> um, and iMarket of the Year and iMedia Agency of the Year. Thank you. 2015 was an amazing year for you. It was. Um, how are you going to top that in 2016? <laughs> we will I can't find wait a way. to see. I have no, absolutely no doubt. <laughs> Congratulations on all the business that you've thank won. You. You. And you clearly bring so much heart and soul to what you do. The industry really needs and we need um, leaders like you. Thank you. And I really, really again want to applaud you for um, making some bold statements that will start a conversation. If we don't start having conversations about some of the tougher things, I think it's going to be hard for us to grow and change uh, for the consumer, as you point yeah. out. I promise you I will continue to. to make bold statements. Thank you. <laughs> it's been so great to meet you and you spend time well. together. Thank you.